So welcome, everybody, today to our conference on cell biology of neurodegeneration. And, but now you will all have some questions. Why are we holding this here at the Italian Academy? And what am I doing here? Um, I'm David Friedberg, and um, I'm director of this building. And, but I say, why am I here? Because, in fact, um, I'm actually a humanist. Um, I teach the history of art. So you may well be asking here at Columbia, and you may well be asking, what is this man doing over here? So let me tell you. So I've been directing this, in, this academy, the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies in America, since the turn of the century. I like to say that now. It sounds very long time ago. Since 2000. And the first thing I did when I came here was to set up a multidisciplinary program for postdocs and upwards. And it was specifically intended to be a program that brought advanced uh, researchers to this place in both the humanities and the neuroscientists, and, and, and both humanities and science in general, but specifically neuroscience. So why did I do this? I was concerned at the time, 2000, that the humanities and the sciences were not really talking to each other. We were making occasionally cocktail conversation, and most scientists I discovered, certainly most neuroscientists, knew something about art. They go to museums. I had supper with all the speakers last night but one, so I know this. I confirmed this hypothesis by, with a good range of 10 subjects, and they all regularly go to museums, and they all can talk very eloquently about art, at least as eloquently as I. But if I can tell you one thing, that if you ask a humanist to talk talk about microtubules, zero. <laughs> I'm coming back to microtubules at the end of this introduction. So listen, I've only been given five minutes. I'm trying to keep it into five minutes. But fortunately or unfortunately, I should say, I'm conveying to you the apologies of the Consul General, um, Francesco Genuardi, who wished he could be here just to give you some kind of political confirmation, as if we needed that. But he was going to be here to extend uh, a welcome, but unfortunately he's been delayed, obviously for political reasons, at the consulate. So let me go on. I take six minutes, perhaps. So there were two reasons for my introducing the program. First of all, as I say, because humanists and sciences were not talking to each other. And then, as an art historian, I asked myself, how can one talk about art or looking at images without talking about the brain? This is a really important question, it seemed to me. Most of my colleagues, you know, this is the post-Cartesian view. Very easy to blame the French for being distracting. Excuse me, Frank. Um, this is the post-Cartesian view that somehow art comes out of the mind. And I would say to people, so what's, you know, we shouldn't we be talking about the brain, but being these sort of influence that so many Westerns, Westerners are by Descartes, they said, no, mind and brain are separate. Well, we now know differently. Thanks, of course, to the scientists. Also seemed to me very important that we understand I was never trying to turn humanists into scientists or scientists into students of literature or art, although to some extent they are. But I wanted people to listen to each other to understand the epistemological basis of how each broad field works. In other words, can we listen to each other? Can we understand humanists, for example, like talking about context? Scientists often like talking about redu reductionism, or they are reductionists in their approach. They try to get to the essential cause of things. Humanists say, well, we look at the dense constitution of contexts that affect the essential cause of things. But these, but as you know, you guys talk about contexts all the time. The humanists forgot that in order to understand human behavior, human, um, the, the very nature of humanity, you have actually to get down to basic principles. And so we set up this program, and it's been an extraordinary success. We've had years and years of conferences, especially about cognitive neurosciences. So that's why I'm really happy that today we have some basic people here. And it's an honor for us to have you here. I want to say something else. that. Being the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies in America, I had a terrible struggle at Columbia. People used to think that 
you would come here and you would find out all about good food. After all, who eats better than Italians? You would find out all about fashion, because who is better at fashion than Italians? And I think I can still risk saying this at this moment, because it's reality, because the Italian women are more beautiful than anyone anywhere else. So this was the kind of cliche which hung around. This was not very good for the image of Italian science. I mean, we all think, certainly we know the Germans can do science. We know the French. This is a gesture to, the, we know the Dutch can do science. This is a gesture to all the Dutch people here today. We know the French can do science. We know the Russians can do science. But the Italians, they were good at all these other things, at living, at being vigorous, at being charming, and so on. But I was working with the mirror neuron group in Parma for some time because of my interest in human responses to what they see in images. And right now we have here all these Frenchmen, Dutchmen, Russians um, together with us today. But we also have the key figures, the beginnings and the end, the alpha and omega of this conference, conference today, Bartolini and De Camilli. So we have achieved the two aims that I set out at the beginning, bringing the sciences and the humanities together and showing what Italian science can do in its role as a leader in research. I should, of course, um, Suboji is here, I should have also said we all know that the Indians are the most brilliant in mathematics and <laughs> chemistry and so on. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to conclude, but I, this conference would not have taken place, I said this right at the beginning, had it not been for microtubules and calcium signaling. I remember uh, when I first met Francesca, which seems like at least 20 years ago, probably slightly more recently, and I was thinking, we, you know, of having who are the lively scientists on campus whom we might have as fellows. And somehow I had an introduction to Francesca, and she said, let me tell you what microtubules are. And I have never had a more gripping hour and a half, not even talking about Leonardo, than my evening talking with Francesco about microtubules. So all of, the, all of you are going to talk about microtubules and, cal and cal calcium signaling and the very many other things that are going to happen today, which I, you, will, uh, you will learn about yourself, the translational stuff as well as the basic science, welcome here today. You are part of our mission. I'm sure that you will continue to make a great contribution not only to intellectual life on this campus, but to the very problems that you are going to be, be talking about today and what could be a more important subject than neurodegeneration. It deserves to be a huge conference. I'm happy to see so many of you here. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you for bringing yourselves here. Welcome again. And now Francesca is going to continue talking about my... That's right. Thank you, <laughs> David. More about my pupils. No. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody, dear colleagues, uh, friends, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first symposium on cell biology of neurodegeneration here at the Italian Academy. You heard a lot about it. And uh, so I think one of the... Um, I think everybody... It, it, in my opinion, it was a high time that such an event took place to highlight the contribution of cell biology to the fight against the neurodegeneration, which is a huge burden on society. So, um, and I think everybody in this audience would agree that uh, discoveries, uh, for example, of disease, um, of uh, mutation uh, causing disease, uh, see, mutation, mutation that cause disease, have greatly enriched our knowledge and get, get us closer to decipher the molecular determinants that generate neurodegeneration, that promote neurodegeneration. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to the cell biology of these proteins, of these mutant proteins, and how they actually promote neurodegeneration in the context of the pathology. And I think this is actually the biggest and most critical hurdle to our development, to the development in general of effective therapeutic strategies. So um, because of that, uh, we thought that it would be really important to, uh, today to present outstanding examples of how employing, the, for example, state-of-the-art cell biology approaches can get us closer to decipher the mechanism underlying neurodegenerative disease 
Also, we think it was important to share information and provide an avenue of how basic cell biology translates into impact on neurodegenerative disease research, but also more broadly to the onset of other types of neuronal injuries, like for example, motor neuron disease, but also peripheral neuropathies. And I think this format especially is very important to provide a stimulating opportunity for students, postdoctoral fellows and faculty to build the cross-cutting collaborations and uh, that could lead, for example, to breakthroughs in the field, right? So, um, so for uh, today, um, so to my knowledge, there has never been a, a comparable symposium with this uh, uniquely uh, focus on uh, this mission. And uh, uh, so we were very lucky to bring together a phenomenal lineup of speakers who all share an interest in cell biology and the mechanism, uh, the basic mechanism of cell biology that promotes neurodegeneration, including the two phenomenal, um, very young investigators who are going to give a talk today as well. So the major topics of cell biology, uh, of cell biological mechanism that are implicated in neurodegeneration will be discussed ranging from the cytoskeleton to uh, protein and organ and homeostasis, but also calcium signaling. And, uh, um, and what I want to remind you is that there are going to be two breaks, two complimentary break, coffee breaks. I want also to remind you that uh, you're going to have free time for the lunch break. And uh, uh, don't miss uh, the poster exhibition downstairs in the afternoon. And uh, um, also, uh, the program is going to end with a phenomenal speaker, our invited keynote speaker, Pietro De Camilli, followed by a closing reception, which is going to give you the opportunity to meet with the speakers, uh, with the poster presenters. So please don't miss it, because there's going to be wine and snacks and hors d'oeuvres. So Stick around for that. And uh, so let me just tell you that, uh, remind the audience that the restrooms are actually in the basement. You can get there through the elevator or through the stairs. Also, I want to uh, say that uh, in the interest of time, we're not going to be able to introduce each speaker prior to their talks. So uh, if you're more interested about their bios, you can read their bios in the flyer that has been provided to you at the entrance. And uh, I want to really remind the speakers to be mindful of their time. Uh, so you guys have 25 minutes, a lot of time for talks. Marianne here has been trained to give you a five minutes warning prior to the end of the talk and prior to the five minutes that we allotted for questions and answers. And uh, what else do I have to say? I think it's all done, right? So uh, without further ado, let's go. Thank you for coming. The most important thing, I'm sorry, I have to acknowledge the people without whom this, this event would have not been possible. So, Bajik, come with me. You can do it together. So, uh, so, the first thing is, of course, I have to thank the Italian Academy because without their support, it's not 20 years, it's 10, but that's okay. <laughs> it feels like 20, right? Uh, without their support, this event would have not been possible. And a special thank to David Friedberg, of course, the director that you just met, but also to Abigail Asher, without whom nothing would have happened. She's the most efficient organizer ever. So, And of course, Barbara Fedda, who's also a great friend, and Baron, Baron Allison, and Simon for the graphics. I want to thank Melba, who I don't know if she's if here now and because she helped with the catering, but also my husband, David Solzer, for helping with the fundraising, Ruth and Jeanette for establishing the gift fund and uh, managing, it, managing it. And of course, all the sponsors, the donors, they gave us the money without which this would have not been possible. So again, second time, without further ado, let's go, let's get started. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Francesca and Frank and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's great to be here. This is definitely one of the nicest places I've given a talk, very grand. And as you can see, I put on my best suit, so I'm all set. Um, so I'm going to talk about alpha-synuclein, and I'm going to talk about the normal function of alpha-synuclein. 
And I'm going to start uh, this story. So when I was putting this talk together, I realized that it's not just a talk about alpha synuclein, but it's also a talk about serendipity and how one thing leads to another. And I kind of want to make that point um, throughout the talk, and I'll come back to it at the end. And this, of course, is uh, Sri Lanka, which was known as Serendip. Um, and this is the, actually one of the original maps that was made. And if you look carefully, you can see that the name Sarandip is there, and which, from which our word serendipity comes from. And talking about alpha synuclein, um, I just want to point out by this one slide is that there is this enormous amount of evidence for the involvement of this protein in uh, Parkinson's disease and other uh, related neurodegenerative diseases. And the evidence, frankly, is just overwhelming. For example, um, I would like to point out a few things. You know, gene multi there are families with Parkinson's that have multiplications of the synuclein gene. And the disease phenotypes in these patients is actually dose-dependent. Um, there are variations in the synuclein promoter, which actually leads to an increase in the protein levels in sporadic Parkinson's disease. So there is all this evidence suggesting uh, very strongly that uh, excessive amounts of this protein is actually bad for you. So it's very important to understand what this protein normally does so that we can figure out um, what's going on in the disease. Um, what I like about alpha synuclein, and frankly the reason I started working on it, because it looked so simple. So it's a very small 140 kilodalton uh, protein. It has this N-terminus that uh, binds to lipids and folds into helical membranes. It has a central motif that uh, is hydrophobic and helps in aggregation. And it has this C-terminus tail, which starts at amino acid 95, which kind of flaps about in the breeze. That's what people think. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So there is no uh, question that it's a presynaptic protein. So it's highly enriched in synapses. And this is a picture from a mouse model that we had several years ago that was expressing GFP synuclein. And you can see that these are the little boutons uh, synapses where this protein is highly enriched. And if you consider the cell biology of the synapse, um, you have a n n bouton, and you have these uh, vesicles that are loaded with neurotransmitters. And the way, of course, is it's much more complicated, but from a cell biology point of view, the way it works is that when you have an action potential, the vesicles go and fuse with the plasma membrane, you know, they release their contents, and then there is endocytosis, so this process goes on over and over, and this is how it works. And in addition to the recycling pool, there is also a resting pool um, that most likely slowly exchanges with the recycling pool. And the real question is that if you have alpha synuclein in the system, then what does it, what really happens? And uh, most of the data I'm going to show you today uh, is from this technique that we use, uh, which is uh, called fluorence, which is well used in the field. And the way it works is that you, uh, you tag a synaptic protein with a pH-sensitive probe. It's a GFP, but it's pH-sensitive. So normally, the pH of synaptic vesicles is around 5.5, so the GFP is quenched and you don't see the signal. But if and when you have recycling, then the GFP is exposed to the extracellular medium, the fluorescence increases, and then you have endocytosis and recycling. So the rise and fall of fluorescence actually um, gives you an idea of, um, of exo and endocytosis, and this is kind of the way it works. Here's just a synaptic marker. These are synapses, in, uh, living synapses, where you can see the exo and endocytosis happening. And this is something we did several years ago. So what we found that if you have very modest levels of synuclein in the system, you actually have a suppression of the exo and endocytosis. So this is exo and this is endo, and you have a suppression of the exo and endocytosis. And what you're looking at at the end is you, you flood the system with ammonium chloride and alkalinize all the vesicles in that so you can compare different conditions. So from this, um, we had this idea that uh, synuclein is kind of a break or a clutch for neurotransmitter release. And actually, I just realized while putting it that David Sulzer's was lab was one of the first to actually show it in, uh, in PC12 cells. Um, and then we and others have, have kind of promoted this idea that what synuclein is really doing, it's kind of when you, when you have, it's kind of a break for neurotransmitter release. And the way we think this happens is that you have a synuclein multimerizes into a complex. And we propose that synuclein helps in clustering the synaptic vesicles. It's not the only protein that does it. But it helps in clustering the synaptic vesicles so that, if, and, uh, so that when you have vesicles that go to the plasma membrane, it sort of just restricts their egress to the plasma membrane. And this is the way it works. 
Over the years, uh, um, Jacqueline Burry and Tom Sudoff have proposed a model um, which, uh, in which synuclein actually binds to WAMP2 and stabilizes the snare complexes. So as you probably know, the snare complex is a complex that brings vesicles and plasma membrane closer together. So they, uh, they have done a, a, a lot of work to show that synuclein binds to WAMP2 and uh, helps in stabilizing the snare complexes. And in their view, the synuclein binding to WAMP2 or synaptobrevin is, and the stabilization of snare complex helps in maintaining homeostatic levels of the snares themselves, but that synuclein has no effect on neurotransmission per se. That's their model. I'm just the messenger, okay? Um, but we have proposed that it actually has an effect on, on neurotransmitter release. Now, these numbers are very important, so pay attention. So synuclein, as I said, is 1 to 140 amino acids. So they mapped the WAMP2 binding sites to this last 45 amino acids, 96 to 140. And um, we and others have shown that for the vesicle, um, for the uh, vesicle recycling phenotype, it's actually the N-terminus, the 1 to 95, that is important. But of course, synuclein binds to WAMP, and the effect of the C-terminus is not known. So over the years, there's been these two schools of thought. One is uh, that synuclein binds to WAMP2 and promotes snare stabilization, but it has no effect on neurotransmission. And then we have been proposing that it restricts recycling, attenuates uh, neurotransmitter release, and we think the way it does it is um, by clustering uh, synaptic vesicles. And so it's these two sides of the coin. So one, of, one way to think about it is that are we both looking at the same thing? And I come to this uh, synuclein and synaptobrevin. It's been very, uh, sort of a controversial in the field because some people say that they cannot replicate the phenotype, so on and so forth. And most of the work that has been done so far to show the interaction has been in HEC293 cells. So this has been a bit of a problem. So we, we verified this interaction and it is real. So we verified it in, uh, in um, uh, neuronal cell lines and primary neurons. And this is, I'm showing you data from neuronal cell lines. These are Neuro2A cells. And here, They've been transfected with either full-length synuclein or a synuclein which is 1 to 95 that lacks the WAMP2 binding site. And you can see that a lot of WAMP2 is brought down by synuclein when it's full length, but that the 1 to 95 doesn't bring down any synuclein. So it interacts, but we wanted to see it whether the interaction happens at the synapses. So for that, we use this system, which is a, a, it's a venous fluorescence complementation system. So you take uh, venous fluorescent protein and you break it into two halves and normally the halves are not fluorescent. You bind one to WAMP and the other to alpha synuclein and essentially if uh, the two proteins come together then the fluorescence, the molecule will be reconstituted and you will have fluorescence. So we did the experiment with full length and one to 95 synuclein and actually it works really well. So in HEC293 you can see that the WAMP2 being a uh, transmembrane protein it goes and binds to vesicles and then the synuclein goes and binds there but if you use the 1 to 95, there is actually no binding here. And same thing at the synapses. So you have a lot of fluorescence at the, at the synapses uh, when you have full length synuclein, but with 1 to 95, you really don't get uh, any fluorescence. So uh, the binding is real. But the question we had is that, could it be that the WAMP2 binding um, of synuclein is required for the uh, synaptic phenotype that we are describing. And you may think that why has not this been done before? It seems like an obvious question, right? So the field has been um, really uh, been influenced by this, uh, this piece of data that I'm showing you here, which is that when you express an alpha synuclein that lacks the WAM2 binding domain, you still get a suppression of neurotransmitter release. So here you can see that they've used, so this is a paper by Robert Edwards lab. You can see that they used a synuclein deletion that has one to 110 amino acids. And this one also suppresses neurotransmitter uh, uh, recycling. So, and this one, um, you know, contains, uh, lacks the WAMP2 binding site. So that was the idea. But if you've been paying attention to numbers, you'll notice that the, the construct used here actually does contain the WAMP2 binding site that starts at 95, right? So this is 1 to 110. So we repeated these experiments. So when we used a uh, synuclein construct that is 1 to 110, then indeed it does suppress recycling, just as Robert's uh, reported. 
So here you can see this is the green stuff, so it, it does. But when we used a 1 to 95 synuclein that definitely lacks the MAM2 binding site, then drum roll, there is, there is no effect on, on neurotransmission, which was interesting. So we wondered whether this 96 to 110 was the real site where MAM2 was binding. And to, to see that, first what we did was we made these constructs and did a simple IP experiment with full length and 1 to 110. And if, uh, if the binding site was indeed between 95 and 110, you would expect that both the full length and the 110 would bind with equal affinity uh, to WAMP2. And actually, that's exactly what happened. Here you can see that if you have the full length or if you have the 110, you um, bring down similar amount of WAMP2. So now we thought that this is interesting. It could really be that this is the WAM2 binding site. So we um, focused on this region between 95 uh, and 110, and we scrambled the amino acids. So this is a very common way of seeing whether a, a site is actually binding or not. So here you can see the wild type, and you have two scrambled mutations. And indeed, both the scrambled mutations um, prevented the binding of WAM2 and synuclein. So now we thought well, we were really onto something. So we, we did alanine mutagenesis, and this is a, a very well-known technique as well, where you replace uh, consequent amino acids with alanine. So alanine is like a mimic. It mimics the size and the charge, but it really doesn't do what the amino acids normally do. So we started from 95 to 110 and sequentially mutated uh, three amino acids uh, all along this uh, region, and then did our IP experiments. And this is the data. So this lane right here is the wild type. You can see a lot of AMP2 has been brought down. Brought down. And at, from here to here, you're kind of walking towards the 110. And this is, for example, this is 96 to 98 is mutated. This is 98 to 110 is mutated. And you can see that gradually, as you go towards 110, you actually increase the AMP2 and synuclein binding, really um, indicating that this small region is the real region where WAMP2 and synuclein bind. So now we, have, uh, now we wanted to do the uh, fluorine experiments with these mutations. Um, so as I showed you before, if you have wild type synuclein, then you have suppressed suppression of recycling. Um, but when we use the scrambled mutations, where only the 96 to 110 is scrambled, you completely abolish the phenotype. And the same exact thing happens when you mutate only three amino acids. So this is just 96, 97, 98 is converted to alanine. Just mutating those three amino acids completely abolishes the ability of synuclein to suppress recycling. So we really think that um, both these phenotypes that we've been describing are related, and we really have been looking at two sides of the same coin. So I think that instead of two schools of thought, we should really have one school of thought where what synuclein is really doing is binding to WAMP2, stabilizing the snares, but that phenotype is, uh, is responsible for the recycling uh, phenotype that we've been describing. And what about clustering of vesicles? So I'm gonna quickly show you this, uh, uh, some stuff we did with Ed Chapman, and these are single molecule experiments where you just look at, it's purely in vitro where you have a cover slip and you're looking at uh, labeled vesicles and you're asking whether the vesicles cluster or not, and you throw in synuclein, so these vesicles have WAMP2 in them, but you either throw in synuclein or you don't, or you throw in the mutations, and you just ask whether, uh, how the vesicle clustering is happening in this reduced system. And if you don't have synuclein, you have some, this is just non-specific clustering, but if you do have wild-type full-length synuclein, then you have a lot of clusters of vesicles formed. Um, and indeed, these data panned out, like this was done completely blindly, and it panned out exactly as we had expected. So the 1 to 110 that does suppress recycling also clusters vesicles, whereas all the constructs that um, do not uh, suppress uh, recycling also fail to um, cluster synaptic vesicles. So we, pro we, we think that this is what's going on, so we propose this model where you have synuclein on, uh, on one vesicle and you have WAMP on the other one, and then we think that the multimerization of synuclein kind of creates a phenotype where you have, uh, where it brings the vesicles closer together, and this is definitely not uh, the only protein. Uh, this is one of the proteins that, that does it. But my story of serendipity is not over yet. I wanna show you one last thing, which I'm sure at least two people in the audience must be thinking about it. 
So you may recognize these two names, um, Anna Marie and David are in the audience, and they published this paper many years ago, not many years ago, sorry, 2004. <laughs> Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, they, they showed that synuclein actually undergoes this phenomenon called chaperone-mediated autophagy. So synuclein is uh, one of the proteins that's, um, that, that does that. And uh, the, the way this phenomenon happens is that you have the cytosolic proteins that have these domains. Um, and these domains bind to chaperones, and the chaperones kind of carry it into the lysosome. And this, you know, Anne Murray has done a lot of work on it. Um, and the key here is this, is, this, is this domain which actually binds to these chaperones. And guess where that domain is? They map this domain, and it's exactly the WAMP2 binding site that I'm describing, which is between uh, 96 to 98. So I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, but when we saw this data, when I saw this data, I, I realized that now I was asking a question that I didn't even think about asking before, which is that if indeed uh, synuclein is recognized by the site and is undergoes chaperone mediated autophagy, then how come that's not happening at the synapse? Because you do have the protein hanging out there. Um, so we think that there is a uh, competition for the site between uh, uh, for WAMP2 and the CMA uh, phenomenon, and we are kind of working on that this is probably related to disease, that when you have more synuclein, you um, lose the WAMP2 binding and you have more of the CMA going on. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and also acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, most of the work uh, is done by these two people, Jichao um, and Lena, and, I, and uh, Ed Chapman's lab and Huan uh, helped with the single molecule experiments that I showed you. And then I also want to acknowledge Pankaj, who's here with me, who's starting to work on synuclein. And uh, thank you again for your attention. Time. Do I take questions, or how does it work? Oh, David has questions. Hi. Um, is alpha synuclein released in synaptic cleft and therefore also causes some sort of a propagation of the disease in Parkinson's? So there is a, there is a whole uh, lot of people actually looking at that. So the synuclein is definitely released. Now, whether it's released from the synapse or not, I don't think we know. Uh, people haven't been able to study this phenomenon that you're saying in a physiologic sense. Most of the times, they, the way they look at it is by actually throwing in synuclein from the outside and creating the phenomenon. So I think it happens for sure, uh, the release, but whether it has anything to do with pathology or not, I'm not sure. But a lot of people think it is. So, Subhidra, nice talk. I was just wondering, do the other synucleins, beta, gamma, uh, whatever they are, do they have the sequence? Do they, are they involved in this? That's a great question. Um, they don't have this exact same sequence in this region. They actually have other, uh, so the answer is they're all different. And we don't know why, but we are looking into that. Exactly, it's a very good question. Does the overexpression of the alpha synuclein in the experiments that you do with the HEK cells, does that impact on your interpretation of the data? Perhaps you're looking at a pathological action and not mm -hmm. the normal action of That's the That's a great question too, yeah. So, the question is that because all, our, all the data that I showed you is from overexpression, is it pathological or physiologic? So there's two points. First of all, um, you know, we can create subtle mutations in the protein, even in the overexpressed setting, and completely block the phenotype. So that suggests it is. But some of the data that I didn't show you is that actually when you uh, take out synuclein acutely from these neurons, you have the opposite phenotype. You actually have an excessive release. And that's also been shown in vivo in the mice that that happens. So we think that we are studying a physiologic phenomenon. So VAMP2 or synaptic brevin, there's multiple isoforms and they seem to be involved in membrane fusion throughout the cell. Does alpha synuclein bind to any of the other isoforms? I don't know. So you mean synaptic brevin isoforms? Yeah. Hmm. To where it could be, you know, messing up other forms of membrane fusion throughout the neuron instead of just at the synapse with yeah. fusion. I don't know, actually. Oh, okay. 
Very nice talk. Uh, are there any disease mutations in the critical region that forms the heart of your hypothesis? No. Um, so there's, there are, there's no mutations in this region. The, all the mutations are in the N terminus. Okay. But um, the, this has also been missed. So the N terminus mutations, we think that does influence the binding of VAMP um, with these proteins. And we have some data to suggest that that is happening. So we don't know how this is happening. Though. If you go fishing for other interacting partners besides the ones that you nicely told us about, do you find anything else that binds that region, perhaps? In this Something region. that could influence vesicle cycling or fusion or anything like that? Uh, you mean in this region or in... Yeah, so have you, if you've yeah. done yeast 2 hybrid with that, with that as bait. Actually, it's a great idea. We haven't done specifically, we just, you know, these experiments are very unpublished here. But that's something that we are thinking of. I mean, there's a lot of studies looking at interactors of synuclein, but whether this specific region, we, uh, I don't think anybody has looked at it. Pass it down. Can oh. off, uh, alpha synuclein induce the phase separation of synaptic vesicle, just like a <laughs> lipid droplet? I think Pietro might know the answer to that. So uh, this, in the C-terminus, there are these IDR domains. Um, three of them. Uh, I think it does, but we haven't seriously pursued that yet. So uh, this is a wonderful story about physiological uh, really role and great role of synuclein. And uh, uh, how, what is your vision of uh, synuclein aggregation without any mutations, uh, which occurs in also in idiopathic PD patients, um, uh, how that happened. So uh, we, we all have synuclein mm -hmm. without mutations. So why uh, in 80% of patients, uh, you know, uh, it starts to aggregate? If I knew what that, I wouldn't vision? be here. Right? I mean, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. You know, one of the things that I already mentioned, the chaperone hypothesis that Anna Murray has proposed for many years. I think the one possibility is that if the synaptic synuclein is binding to WAMP, and that's stabilizing the protein out there, and it's kind of blocking the protein from going into CMA. Maybe if you have some dysregulation of the synuclein ramp interaction, then it would force the protein to actually go into the CMA, and that could start a pathologic process. It's speculative at this point, but it's possible that that's one of the... Hi. So alpha-synuclein has been proposed to be a fatty acid binding protein, mm -hmm. um, and I know it's at a different region of the protein, but have you looked at lipid composition uh, for affecting binding uh, to VAMP? Oh, um, no, but that's a good idea. Yeah, you haven't looked at it. Have you looked at the post-translational modifications of alpha-synuclein? Lysines are quite modified, and also for, by, for example, sumo. I know that sumo related, but it's also acetylated. In so, addition to phosphorylation, right? So, the what effect would that have on the binding and so on and so forth? No, we, so that's a, those are actually experiments that we have planned. So, there's phosphorylation is a very important. There's a 129 site that gets phosphorylated in disease. So, we've done some experiments. But I don't have a clear answer for that yet. Thank you. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd also like to start off by thanking uh, the organizers, Francesca and Frank, for uh, bringing us all together here and uh, uh, having already uh, like a fantastic meeting. Um, my lab is very interested in uh, the cytoskeleton, especially the cytoskeletal uh, arrangements and reorganizations and remodeling underlying neuronal polarity, neuronal development, uh, and, and uh, when a neuron, for example, uh, undergoes synaptic plasticity, what happens at the spine, at the morphology of the spine, um, is our microtubules involved and, and the active cytoskeleton. We're also interested in um, trafficking and transport mechanisms in axons and dendrites, and uh, how sorting takes place, and how cargos uh, make a decision, either they want to go into the axon and, and, or in the dendrites. Uh, but today I want to share a story with you, which is um, more about uh, the initial segment, especially the axon initial segment. 
And just to get you a little bit up to speed with that, uh, this is this, I think, amazing structure here. This is in the uh, proximal axon. So here you have the cell body and the dendrites. And this is a, a, a compartment which is kind of unique for neurons. Uh, it separates the cell body and the dendrites from the rest of the axon. Um, the electrophysiologists in the room know that this is the place where action potentials are generated and, and modified. If you look from more um, a molecular and cell biological perspective, uh, it's like a boundary between the action of the dendrites, and it's also a regulation area where cargoes are sorted. Uh, there's a lot of studies going on where axonal cargoes are like checked here uh, before they enter the axon, uh, and dendritic cargoes are actually sent back around this area in the initial segment and sent back to the dendrites. So it's a, a kind of a sorting station. Uh, and it's beautiful because we have very nice markers and they, they label this, uh, this beautifully, this, uh, this action initial segment. Uh, in the old days, um, before we had any knowledge about the molecular composition of the initial segment, uh, we didn't know there was anchorine or neurofessin or any of the markers. This is basically uh, what they did by, by uh, electron microscopy to see what is the first part of the axon, or basically the proximal axon. And uh, part of the identification, um, or the, let's say the morphological criteria to know by EM sections if you were in the axon, was this particular kind of microtubule structures, which were called uh, vesicles of microtubules. So these are these microtubules that are very close together. They're uh, closely spaced, very unusually closely spaced. It's very hard to find these microtubules so closely spaced in any other region of the brain. And you see these cross bridges. So they identified, basically, if you do uh, uh, sections of EM and you would find these structures, you basically know you're in the proximal axon and, and what we now know is the initial segment. So there's always these microtubules that are together, like between five and nine of these microtubules finding in clusters. The other thing to mention is these microtubules, these clusters are found very closely to the plasma membrane. So the, of course they're also in the middle, but these clusters are often found closely to the membrane. There are several of these images uh, that people show. Um, and I will come back to that uh, in a second. So now we'll, we, we go on. This was uh, published uh, in the 60s. We move on 40, 50 years uh, later. And now we know much more what happens in the initial segment and what the molecular composition is. <clears throat> so there's sodium channels which generate the action potentials. There's uh, several transmembrane proteins, for example, neurofessin here, 186, I will talk about a little bit later. And the major protein, scaffolding protein, is anchorin G. It's not a transmembrane protein, it's a, it's a, scaffold, a scaffolding protein, as I said. And it anchors these receptors here and it clusters them in these domains. Underneath is spectrin and actin, uh, etc. So there's a lot of a lot of papers now with super resolution about. Uh, I'm sure you have seen these beautiful pictures with the ring structures, um, uh, and all these spectrins and actins have these beautiful kind of periodic rings in the in the axon. Um, as I said, the function of this is to act as a diffusion barrier, uh, not only for cargos that are sorted in but also for uh, membrane proteins that diffuse along the membrane. And basically the initial segments is basically anchors them and traps them. And if you're not in the initial segment, you basically diffuse away from, from these regions. Um, as you can see here, uh, I put a question mark. So uh, initially it was identified by particular microtubule structures, uh, but the field moved more to the fact uh, about this membrane complex and the initial segment in, uh, identification. So we be became very interested in what is actually the, the link between this membrane complex and anchorin and the underlying microtubule cytoskeleton. And um, the question I want to raise today and, and discuss with you, what is the molecular link between the membrane complex and the underlying microtubule cytoskeleton? Um, we came, became interested in these questions um, already uh, some years ago when we did an unbiased screen for uh, N-binding proteins. So N-binding proteins are these uh, EB, 1, 2, 3, uh, microtubule plus N tracking proteins that are on the plus ends of microtubules. Uh, I think you all have seen these beautiful movies. Uh, um, 
the lab of Anna Agmanova, which is a neighboring lab in my institute, uh, and together with um, Michael Steinmetz, uh, uh, got the structure of this and identified this SXIP motif, uh, that uh, proteins have this SXIP motif and bind specifically to, to EB proteins, somewhere here in this hinge here. So what we did was we, we took these proteins, EB1, EB2, EB3, and did a uh, uh, unbiased pull-down. So we just coupled them to GST for fishing in hex cells and in brain lysates and see what kind of proteins come down. And in addition, we did a prediction uh, just by uh, looking at uh, all the, the, the genome sequences, how many proteins actually have SXIP motifs. So we came up with an SXIP score so the higher the score, the more SXIP motifs you have. And here, this is a MOSCOT score of the, uh, the peptides that we found in the MOSPEC. As you see it, you get this plot where basically you find a lot of proteins that are known plus and tracking proteins like PLASPs, uh, MACF, uh, P150 cap, etc., etc. So these are in red. What was striking to me at the time is that there were two proteins here which was anchoring. So anchorin, anchorin B, and anchorin G. And anchorin G, I just showed you, is the, the major protein at the action initial segment. And I was surprised by this number. It had 10 predicted SXIP motifs. And you can say, okay, anchorin G is a huge protein, so what's the likelihood of that? But it, was, it struck me because it's not so easy, actually, to get these long proteins down in the sense of pull-downs, and uh, somehow it was enriched. Um, in the there were two follow-up papers on this. Uh, one was from actually from uh, uh, Letelier, uh, we, who we identified and, and published on the interaction between anchor engine uh, G and EBs, and later on we followed up uh, with, with another paper around it. So here you can see that anchor G is in the initial segment, and if you stain for EB1, it really nicely colocalizes at the initial segment, and it really concentrates in this region. Yeah, which is a little bit awkward for a plus and binding protein because normally it's on the plus tips of microtubules here, as you can beautifully see. And here it's really enriched. It's not so clear if it is actually on the plus tips or it accumulates. It can also be that there's a lot of plus ends growing here. It's very dynamic and it is just looks like a stretch almost instead of a, a single dot or a single plus end. Here. So um, the interaction was confirmed. Um, if you a uh, knockdown anchor in G, you reduce the level of EB in, these, in the initial segment. If you do an EB1, EB3 knockdown, you also reduce the levels of anchor in G. So there seems to be a cooperative like interaction between the two. You need one to set up the other one, etc., and reverse. So I think this was an, this, these are interesting papers to think about. Um, there was another paper we published uh, around a protein called Trim46. Uh, which is a microtubule binding protein. Uh, it localizes to the proximal exon. You see here the anchoring G staining here again, trim 46. It nicely overlaps. If you do a line scan of anchoring G, trim 46 is always a little bit more towards the cell body. This will become later on uh, important in the talk. So you have trim 46 here and then you have anchoring G. It's always a little bit more to the, to the, uh, to the proximal side and anchoring G is more distal uh, to it. But, you know, it's just a little bit. What we found is that TRIM46 is a microtubule binding protein and it's unique because it makes parallel microtubules. So it forms uh, parallel microtubules that are closely spaced and we actually think, going back to this picture here, that these are the cross bridges between the microtubule vesicles. I'll show you later on some data we have around the TRIM46 that uh, we believe that this is actually uh, uh, co the, the, the vesicles, the formation of these microtubule clusters is caused by TRIM46. If you don't, um, in TRIM46 knockdown neurons, um, this is a severe phenotype because it's, you don't form an axon and uh, maybe obviously you don't even form an initial segment later on. If you knock down TRIM46 a little bit later on in neurons after the development, you also lose uh, quite a bit of signal in the initial segment. So I would say there's like three kinds of evidence that there is an interaction between microtubules and the, uh, the more membrane complex of the initial segments. Uh, just to highlight the beauty of this uh, uh, TRIM46 staining, uh, I don't have any stocks or any interest in this protein, but it is a beautiful axonal marker. Yeah? 
uh, Santa Cruz sells it or any other company. It's, it's really beautiful. It always works with any fixative, so uh, you can use it. It also it labels every single neuron in the brain, the axon of every single neuron in the brain. Okay, so back to uh, the initial segment. So we have these proteins like membrane proteins, Durofessin 186. We have scaffolding proteins, Engrin G, and we have the cytoskeleton. I said there's some evidence on EB protein interaction with Engrin. We found this strain 46, uh, 46 uh, protein, and you have the underlying microtubule cytoskeleton. And uh, Emily actually took up this, I would say, challenging uh, job to find out how these proteins all interact and uh, how would it come about and how are these individual components actually organize the actual initial segment. So this is just to highlight again uh, the paper we published. So these stars here, this is Anchor and G, these stars here are the predicted SXIP motifs. Uh, MLE started by mutating all the single SXIP motifs. This protein is uh, quite large, so she did a lot of PCRs and a lot of cloning, and I think she's still proud of that. Uh, so here are the SXIPs. So we took the ones that are conserved and we mutated them. Um, the 480 is a neuron-specific anchorin G uh, splice isoform, which is also called the giant isoform, and there are two other isoforms. If we express this anchorin G, the large isoform, in, neuron, of, sorry, in cell cells, it really nicely plus and tracks. Uh, it, to me, that's somehow surprising, but not really. If you have 10 SXIP motifs, you definitely bind to EBs, and you can plus and track. Uh, it's a soluble protein, as I said, it's not transmembrane. So if you express it, it really nicely binds to EBs and it basically confirms that interaction. If you do it with 190 or 270, you will never see plasma tracking. If you only take the tail with the SXAP motifs here, you basically get the same result, you also plasma track. Uh, then, as I said, she made these mutations in these SXAP motifs, which she called SXNN. So the uh, IP she mutated to NN, and basically uh, this is indicated here, and you will lose the plus and tracking of your, uh, of your anchoring G here. It all makes sense uh, in that case. So this is a nice confirmation that I think anchoring G binds to EBs, it plus and tracks. It's a huge protein, but still there. Uh, it can bind to the microtubule plus and as long as, uh, as there's EBs uh, on the, on the plus and. Okay, so we wanted to, as I said, to reconstitute this a little bit. What happens to the initial segment? Can we put in all the components and see if we can actually create a, some kind of initial segment or at least a structure in cost cells? So I'm going to show you a couple of cost cell experiments where we have anchor in G here. I showed you alone it plus and tracks. But if you anchor it to the membrane by just simply expressing neurofessin, there's an interaction between neurofessin, transmembrane protein, and anchorin you actually get very nicely like anchorin G at the plasma membrane together with neurofessin. And the interesting thing here is if you do this, you see already this like kind of pattern. So if you just stain tubulin, it really nicely co-localize with tubulin. So you have neurofessin here, here you have anchorin G, GFP tech, and basically you get this automatically this complex of anchorin G, neurofessin, and Bind to, uh, uh, bind to to microtubes. So, according to my story, this should be EB dependent, uh, and probably the interaction here between the tail and uh, and the microtubules is EB, EB, EB dependent. So we took this construct, the NN. You still have recruitment of neurofessin and anchorin to the plasma membrane, but you see there's no rearrangement of the microtubules and basically no co-localization, and it doesn't bind anymore. Um, the other experiment we can do is we had these um, U2OS cells, which are uh, stable in uh, knockouts of EB1, 2, and 3. And we do the same experiment, and again, uh, you never see these structures appear anymore. And so it doesn't form this microtubule anchoring G kind of uh, plasma membrane complexes. Um, then we did the EM on it and showed. Uh, we wanted to see if it's really, it's very difficult to, to I mean, you can do super resolution and all kinds of micro, uh, fluorescent microscopy techniques to see if these microtubules are really close to the plasma membrane. 
So in this experiment, these are cost cells. We label neuroph uh, neurofessin. There's a beautiful extracellular antibody. So we label the outside of the neurofessin <coughs> positive cells. You see these microtubules. They really nicely align up very close to the plasma membrane. In the presence of um, anchorin G, this is the distance to the membrane. You recruit many more microtubules to the plasma membrane. And in, in the mutant, uh, there's less, uh, the distance is larger and there's less recruitment to, to the plasma membrane. So we really think that having these already like a couple of components, you're able to link the anchoring G via EB uh, to the microtubule side scale, and you actually recruit the microtubules to the plasma membrane. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit more complicated. And what happens if we put in trim 46? I told you that this is the protein that actually forms these um, uh, vesicles of microtubules, these clusters. Um, so what happens when we put it in? So still, when you put in anchoring G, neurofessin, uh, anchoring G is recruited to the plasma membrane. Uh, you get these stripes. And even you get a, a little bit more bundled stripes. So here you have trim 46, bundles the microtubules, that's indicated here. You really nicely show now that basically having all these three components, you, you have the bundles of the microtubules uh, and the neurofessin and the, and the anchoring G in this cost cell. If you look at EB, it's also recruited very closely to the anchoring G stripes. And as I told you, if you look here in red and green, always the trim is a little bit in front, and then you have the anchoring G and the EB signal. It looks like the, the uh, trim 46 is bundling these microtubules a little bit, but you still have dynamic EBs coming off, and these dynamic EBs actually bind to the anchoring G. So you create a, almost like a self-organizing complex uh, when you have these minimal compounds there. Uh, I said the, the role of trim 46 we be published is to make parallel microtubules. So make microtubules all plus and out. And so to confirm this, we actually started doing EM on these microtubule bundles. And just uh, to remind you, this was the Peterson story. And these are the bundles we get with trim 46. You really nicely get these clusters, uh, like almost these vesicles that was shown by EM. So this is our cost cell experiments, these bundles. And this is the Peterson paper. So I think we really kind of recapitulate uh, at least the microtubule structures that, that are initiated here uh, in these, in these cost cells. Uh, how do we prove that these microtubules are uh, plus and out and parallel bundles? We have a very nice technique, which is lever, uh, laser severing. So we can cut, a la uh, cut with high power laser here the microtubule and then look at the plus ends of the EB plus ends on the growth of the direction of these microtubules. So if you cut, a laser, uh, cut with a laser a microtubule bundle and you get EB signals in both directions, you knew that the bundle was actually anti-parallel. If you cut it and you get a signal, the EB is going in one direction, you know it's a parallel bundle. So that's indicated here. So with normally tubulin, uh, as a control here in pink, these are the EBs that after cutting, so here's the cut, and then you get EBs in two directions, meaning that it was an anti-parallel bundle. If you do anchoring G, so we're talking still at the bundles that are close to the plasma membrane, you basically get anti-parallel bundles. But if you put in trim 46 with bundles, these parallel microtubules, you see, you already see that the microtubules are more bundled, but you only get EBs out of one direction. And basically, you form this, what I would say, what happens at the initial segment. Anchoring G, neurofessin, recruitment, and then a bundle of parallel microtubules. Uh, to even go further, we did a reconstitution experiment in vitro. So with the, with the help of Anna Agmanova and, and uh, a lot of effort to, to purify uh, trim 46, which is not easy, and we even purified anchoring G, uh, and uh, what was even less easy, I would say. We can uh, use these uh, very like almost standard microtubule polymerization assays we add the protein, so here in red, these are seeds of microtubules, all with EBs. And then when the microtubules grow, um, you get sometimes you get single microtubules out of the seeds, or, or double or triple microtubules out of the seeds. And 
we only get trim 46 labeling if there's two microtubules, at least minimally two microtubules growing out of these seeds. And in a single microtubule, you will never see this, this signal. So here are single microtubules coming out of a seed. Trim is absolutely absent, but in a microtubule that actually has, sorry, in a seed that has two microtubules, you see that clearly there's a big difference in the recruitment of the trim 46. So I'm not saying the trim 46 forms these two microtubules and make them parallel, but if they happen to grow together, trim 46 is the one that actually, you know, uh, binds there. And what you also see is that here, and I'll show you in the next picture, you have here growth of a microtubule and shrinkage, growth shrinkage. And here, basically, if the trim is there, you always have this growth and it shrinks back until the trim signal is here. So if you get more microtubules that grow, that move together, let's say, a little bit as a parallel bundle, it will be much harder to depolarize your microtubules from that end. So in that way, it stabilizes the microtubules and it makes this bundle, and you get these beautiful plus ends at the end of, of the bundle. And that's also quantified here. So when we look at the rescue events, um, the, if you add this trim, and it's only at the ones where you have the two bundles or three bundles together, um, you basically have, a, have a, a longer and more stable parallel microtubule, and uh, uh, the rescue frequency uh, just goes up. Uh, this inspired us to do the following experiment, where we look at these in cells again. This is in cells, where we have these microtubule bundles close to the plasma membrane, so this with angerine gene or fessin, and uh, plus trim 46, and we add nocotazole. So if there's no trim 46, you can actually depolymerize these bundles. And otherwise, with trim 46, it's very hard to depolymerize. You see that here. So this is normally with nocotazole, and you get it back to absolutely stable. And trim 46 would also protect uh, microtubules uh, for microtubule depolymerization. Um, so this is the model. We uh, are getting. So we have neurofessin at the plasma membrane. It's a transmembrane protein, anchoring G scaffolding. We have bundles with trim 46. Uh, as I said, trim 46 is a parallel microtubule bundling factor. It's a strong rescue factor and it stabilizes these microtubules. Uh, all these bundles have plus and out microtubules. N uh, neurofessin uh, will anchor anchoring G at the plasma membrane. And you get this complex and there uh, anchor and G can interact with EBs and basically form this kind of stable complex at the plasma membrane. So when we were looking at this, this gives an idea about how these interactions and let's say almost the cooperative interactions occur to make this complex. But we were even more interested, would this be like a very nice trafficking route for more cargoes to come in and basically uh, have some feedback mechanisms this would attract other neurofessin molecules to come in here. It almost looks like a highway if you look at it, right? I mean, it's almost ready to, to come in and bring new neuro, uh, uh, neurofessin or, or any, any other transmembrane uh, uh, molecules. So these is the, are the last two pieces of data I'm going to show you and uh, about the question, is this unique membrane microtubule organization allows for the targeting of more of the AES proteins? And um, what we did, we, we started imaging the neuro, uh, neurofessin, just as an example of one of these uh, transmembrane proteins that are in the AES. Um, so we did this, and you get really nice, I mean, a lot of it is stable at the plasma membrane, but they're also pr present in vesicles. It's a transmembrane protein. Uh, so you see dynamics, um, and I'm just going to first show you this. So what we found is that uh, the, the neurofessin is actually present in the endosomal compartment. Uh, there's a lot of co with REP11 and REP5. So we think that this neurofessin uh, houses basically is part of the endosomal uh, 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 recycling there uh, and not so much of the secretory pathway, which we initially thought. But when we do the imaging and you do the trim 46, you see there's much more movement of these vesicles in and out. Uh, there's not so much accumulation anymore. Uh, we can do all the quantifications, and the biggest effect we actually see is if you look in trim 46 depleted cells, there's, there's an increase in reversals if you look at the, the movement of the vesicles, which fits with the, with the hypothesis that if trim 46 would make these parallel bundles, um, 
uh, they don't have to switch microtubules that often, but if you deplete trim 46, you get anti-parallel microtubules even in the axon, and probably the vesicles switch from microtubule to microtubule. Or there is a more complicated situation where you have dynein kinesin uh, misbalance in, 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 in that case. At least, uh, uh, I think from this, we kind of uh, concluded that the trim 46 promotes efficient trafficking of neurofessins in this, in this uh, endosomal pathway. But well, we got very interested in this endosomal recycling because if it's part of the endosomal system, then it should actually uh, uh, be taken up from the plasma membrane and this neurofessin uh, should recycle uh, in, in, in some way in these uh, REP5, REP11 vesicles. So we did a surface staining and that was nice because we have these extracellular antibodies. We just can feed them to the neurons. And uh, if you just look at surface over internalized staining, indeed, the, if you add antibodies to the surface and you wait a, uh, a couple of minutes, it is internalized. So that means the neurofessin is turning over and it's actually everywhere. So the neurofessin turns over everywhere at the plasma membrane. And these are young neurons, but also in older neurons. You get actually a recycling. But if you overexpress here anchor G for quite a high uh, amount, it stops the recycling. So it basically, it blocks the internalization of the neurofessin, especially at these anchoring G positive uh, structures. So you see there's a big difference if you overexpress anchoring G. You can quantify this. So this is the normal recycling, intercellular over surface. And if you overexpress anchoring G, the internalization is less. And if you do a mutant, which is very nice, uh, there has been work that has been figured out before, this is exactly the interaction site uh, where neurofessin binds to anchoring G, so you can mutate this site uh, in this motif. And basically, there's no interaction between anchoring G and neurofessin anymore, and there's no effect of the internalization, what we saw by normally by the overexpression. Um, I'm not going to show you the data, but if you do anchoring G siRNA, you actually enhance neurofessin uptake. So it all fits in this uh, scheme where um, anchoring G is actually anchored anchoring the neurofessin and prevents it from uptake in the endosomal pathway. Um, so this is the last slide, this is the model. I'm going to walk you through what we think is happening. So uh, anchoring G is at the plasma membrane. It it's, uh, anchors these trim 46 positive microtubules via uh, N-binding proteins. And it provides this, uh, um, this basically transport route of neurofessin. Um, as, I, as I showed you, the anchoring G here locally inhibits endocytosis of these uh, uh, neurofessin uh, uh, transmembrane proteins. Uh, and um, what we believe is that, that this creates like a stable pool at the initial segment, specifically here, because anchoring G is anchored to this trim 46 positive or EB positive uh, microtubules here. So we, you create here a feedback loop that anchors um, more anchoring G and anchors more neurofessin uh, locally at the plasma membrane. Uh, it also will enforce coupling, if you have more anchoring G here, uh, more coupling of more microtubules that are EB positive. And I think that's why you get this, a little bit of this uh, compartmentalization where you have trim 46, this EB stretch, and especially on this EB stretch, you have the anchoring G and the neurofessin uh, accumulating here. Um, we have a lot of experiments to do to fully prove it. None of this is published, so I'm really happy to have your input here. Uh, I think the conclusion is that if you reconstitute, uh, try to reconstitute all these, these mechanisms, uh, uh, we have to be careful and look at all these feedback loops and basically uh, uh, think about it as an almost like a self-organizing system. And I'm sure there's a lot of kinases there and phosphatases that regulate this and any other protein. But this is trying to figure out what is the basic mechanism for that. Um, so I have to thank, uh, this is all done uh, still in, uh, in my old lab in Utrecht University by one postdoc, Emily. Uh, this is my new lab. I asked them yesterday to send a picture of the lab and they sent me this. So this is like a couple of months ago when uh, Christina Aguilera gave a, gave a concert and they basically s told me in the lab email, yeah, this picture of the lab, you should look for Wally. <laughs> or Waldo, it's Waldo called here, right? So somewhere they're here, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Boy, a lot of questions. 
So uh, I, it's interesting that in your cost uh, cell experiments, the anchoring G seems to extend all the way to the um, to the lamina of the cells. And I wonder what is your thought about uh, restriction of the anchoring G to the proximal side? Why it doesn't travel with uh, with EB proteins all the way to the tip? And a related question is whether you looked also at anchoring B in these cost cells, and what is the localization of anchoring B? Yes. So. Uh, the last question, anchor in B, we didn't look at it, uh, simply because I have to motivate people to work on these huge proteins <laughs> and express them and clone them, and it's 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 like dining, it's 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 awful. Anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, we're we're of course thinking about that because it could be have wider implications uh, in in other cell types. And the first question is that if you don't put the transmembrane protein neurofessin in it, it will plus and track. Yeah. So there's no it just behaves like a plus and tracking protein. If you put the neurofessin in, you get these beautiful stretches. And I actually don't know why it self-organizes in these beautiful, why it doesn't, why it isn't patchy. Maybe because it's driven by the EBs, but it's a very good, very good point. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah. You're gonna have some uh, theoretical physicists look at it in pattern recognition, but I mean, I'm not saying that they cannot figure it out, but that, yeah, I, I cannot understand what they are talking about. That's basically the point. But it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Beautiful talk, Casper. Um, I have two questions, one general and one specific. In terms of general, this is a beautiful highway to traffic to the AIS and back. Do you think it's more broadly a sorting mechanism for axonal cargo? Uh, or do you think it's um, specific for the AIS? Yeah, I mean, th that's a very good point. Uh, we and, and your lab was also involved in in publishing these papers where dynein is, is activated uh, somewhere mysteriously around this anchoring G and we yeah. don't completely understand why and I think this is really nice if you almost physically you have the microtubules there you need a checkpoint so I'm a big fan of that but I have no no further evidence for that uh, yeah and then specifically have you looked more at the uh, term 46 microtubule interaction is it forming a, a dimer itself that's bringing the microtubules yeah. here and is it very stable or is it more like PRC that it comes in and out of the yeah. uh, microtubule no, organization? That's, that's a good point. So we, we're trying to get the crystal structure. So the first step was already purifying the protein. That's why we could do the in vitro assay. Yeah. Scaling it up is a little bit more difficult. But the first uh, indication is it is a dimer. Uh, actually, it's a trim protein, has a ring finger, and the ring finger forms a, di forms a dimer, and then it has two microtubule binding sites there. If we frap it, even in, in, in vitro, it is rock stable. Uh, okay, so it's so unbelievable, yeah. Uh, Anna said that there must be something <laughs> wrong with the analysis. <laughs> it's very stable, yeah. So once it's bound between the two, it's, it's hard to get off. And that explains the hard edge you have, yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Yeah. I wanted to ask you why EB1 there, this EB protein are at the tip of growing microtubules and this is the place where you have very stable microtubules. So what the, how do you explain it? I mean, what is your interpretation, <laughs> suggestion? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. I, I actually, you know, I have no clue because it is, it's very long. You, you could argue, I mean, if you look at the microtubules and you would and you count the plus tips, there's many more EB molecules there than actually, than you would expect from the microtubules. So I think it binds along the lattice. Uh, there are some papers that you can get lattice binding of EBs. So I think it is lattice binding, uh, maybe lower affinities. Uh, and it is very dynamic if you do frappe. Yeah, the, the EBs are very dynamic, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, maybe it's because of the 10 SXIP motifs, you basically, it wants to bind some microtubules, but also to, this, to the anchoring G. Uh, Jack, kill window. The AIS is subject to uh, geographical regulation yeah. uh, with inactivity, according to Juan Baroni. Yeah. Uh, have you looked to see whether the splicing of uh, uh, anchoring changes with inactivity? And That's have any of your reagents been used to get smoking gun evidence that your cycle is involved in homeostasis. Yeah, so that's, that's a, we are obviously very interested in the, in the movement of this uh, AES. So in our experiments, what we can do, we can just uh, put a KCL in and it actually moves. So you see the, the, the translocation of the AES. Uh, we did not look in the splicing events. 
we know that it is microtubule dependent. So it, if you add no cortisol, it doesn't move anymore. If you delete trim 46, it doesn't move anymore. But that's all we know. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to see this translocation of the AAS. Yeah. I know it's not a satisfactory answer, but yeah. We moved a little. Yeah, we moved. It's, still, it's not like. <laughs> so, what is the extent of the damage that happens, that occurs as a result of a partial or complete disruption of the AIS in terms of transport, polarity, synapse formation? Have you looked at that? Yeah, sorry, I took out the slide. I mean, um, 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 uh, Raspband and, and, and other people in the field have done a really nice experiments in that in, in um, uh, knockout mice, uh, specifically in subpopulation of neurons, like in Purkinje cells. So they, if, I mean, if you knock it out, it's, it's lethal. But um, uh, th there's some really nice papers out there that basically do it in Purkinje cells, specifically. And if you delete the AES, then basically the AES, uh, sorry, the exon uh, is, is being like a, a dendrite. So you get spines on top of it. So it, it it, it's really critical for polarization and I'm and, and, and absolutely sure for, for uh, action initial second or for um, action potential generation. Uh, but the polarity is very interesting, yeah. And I think that was a key finding in the field that let everybody like uh, speculate more about sorting and, 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 and polarity uh, in that sense, yeah. Hi, Hi Kasper. Uh, nice talk. To follow up on that, um, so when are these molecules actually turned on in development? When do they first appear? Which one first, which yeah. one second, and is it cell type dependent? Because you brought up Purkinje cells versus, I'm assuming this were hippocampal or cortical yeah. um, cultured neurons. Yeah. Uh, because there's also the function of neurofascin 186, whether it's formation of the AIS or maintenance of the AIS. Can you yes. give some insight? So I'm, I'm trying to draw here a general picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Anchorin G is, I think, everywhere. Um, uh, a trim 46 is to my knowledge, in every neuron. So in that sense, that makes, but neurofessin, I, I, I agree with that. The timing is, is we're, we're still fighting with the timing. So what is first? Is it first trim 46? Is it first anchorin? It's, it's a little bit of a struggle. So my bet is that trim 46 comes in. Amelie says that anchorin G comes in. And that all depends on our tools because the, the anchorin G antibodies the trim 46 antibodies we have are really good. So if you stain neurons very early, you see the patches, but you don't get anchoring G. But the antibodies for anchoring G, you can argue, maybe are less good. So, so we're trying to do knock-ins, GFP labeling, and, and mo I think it's fascinating. But on the other hand, maybe they can come up at the same time. And that's how it self-organizes. Yeah. And so this trafficking, is this also, can it be extended to other adhesion molecules present at the AIS? And our CAM, for example, or others, or? Uh, yeah, so if you do, we, we tested a few transmembrane proteins. Uh, um, the, the ones that bind to anchoring G are actually, and you can also recruit anchoring G to that. So it doesn't de completely depend on neurofessin only, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm interested in, in how tau factors in with this system. Yeah. So the first, one of the first events when tauopathy develops is that the, it's uh, relocated from the axons back into the somatodendritic compartment. So I'm wondering if there's any sort of reason why the AIS might be involved in that initially, um, and also whether there's differences between, uh, following on with the cell type question, with uh, uh, cells that, ha with neurons that have particularly long axons, that perhaps there's some, some impact at the AIS specifically that might be related to tau and why it relocates. Yeah, so there's, there's two interesting questions. The, the first one is basically a question about how, why is tau only in the axon? And I think a lot of people try to figure that out. We also try to figure it out, but it is quite complicated. So um, if you, uh, endogenously, it's clearly enriched in the axon. Uh, if you overexpress it, it's really difficult. It gets to the dendrite so much, et cetera. So it's very difficult to figure out exactly. But if you take away the AES and trim 46, the tau actually moves into the soma. And uh, there's several papers, and maybe you're aware of that, that even in, let's say, uh, we have missorting of tau in the Alzheimer brain or in mouse models. Uh, people argue that the, the first thing that happens that there is, a, I would say, there's a little bit less AES signal. Uh, so I know a couple of papers maybe coming out that basically 
claim that if you reduced AS level or trim 46 level, then it, it basically diffuses, the tau diffuses back to the cell body and that would be a first kind of uh, indication that something is wrong with that, with that neuron. Um, and they call it a polarity defect in that sense. Um, I, I would say it's all correlation, but uh, it, it could be that AS is basically keeping the tau from entering back into the cell body. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, really interesting. You know, I was, I was um, so in your model, the bundle of microtubules is acting both as a transport um, facilitator as well as an anchoring agent, right? And then so I, thinking back about those uh, images from Palad, the, the EM images, you know, most of the bundles were kind of at the center, you know, yeah. they're not really um, at the periphery, so I mean, you could always argue that yeah. those are the microtubules that are that will eventually go to the periphery. But do you know if anyone has done like serial EMs to really? Yeah, we're we're, it, we're uh, trying to do that, <laughs> uh, but we're not we're not EM uh, expert. So I'm doing that with Judith Klimperman uh, to see if we can reconstitute it. It's a little bit tricky, but um, if you do super resolution, what you can see is that the bundle actually oscillates. So it it. Where anchoring G is, it actually attaches. If you take away anchoring G, then the bundles all get in the middle. So that's that's the. It's it's not that 100% is is bundled at the. Uh, yeah. yeah. In, in your cell line models, there was no inhibition of polarity anywhere else in the cell, but but in a neuron there is. So are any of these molecules specifically involved with polarity? Yeah, so I I didn't discuss that, but basically, if you take away anchoring G or TRIM46, uh, it, and, and you take it away from the beginning before neuron polarity starts, uh, you don't polarize your neuron, yeah. Uh, basically, you, you don't even get an axon. Uh, yes. and, and maybe it's because you don't get an axon because we don't have markers <laughs> that we identify the axon. Uh, tau is missorted, uh, there's no initial segment, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we also do in vitro, in, in vivo experiments by uh, in neutral electroporation, I didn't show you the data, but basically they don't polarize in the cortex. They don't even migrate. They, they have, yeah, big, big phenotypes there. Uh, last question, is there really someone named Feline in your laboratory? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, is there, <laughs> you, given that, yeah. She's, she's, yeah. Okay. she's, she's very good to you. She's <laughs> looking for a job, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>